this is Steve Ritchie. I am responding to a YouTube video entitled Pentecostal Oneness Heresies by John MacArthur because John MacArthur's teachings do not accurately convey what Oneness Pentecostals believe on Oneness theology. Let us play the video clip from John MacArthur from 33 seconds to 55. What do they believe? They believe in what is called modalism, that there's one God and He appears in three different modes. Sometimes He's the Father, sometimes He's the Son, and sometimes He's the Spirit, but He's never all three at the same time. He has these three, these three modes in which He can appear. John MacArthur said that one is Pentecostals believe that God sometimes appears as the Father, at other times He appears as the Son, and at other times He appears as the Holy Spirit, but He is never all three at the same time. We do not believe that God is never all three at the same time. One is Pentecostals do not believe that God is never all three at the same time. For the scriptures teach that after God had become a true human being in the Incarnation through the Virgin, that God now simultaneously reveals Himself as our Heavenly Father, as our Creator, as our Heavenly Parent, as the Son, as a true man in order to save us from our sins, and as the Holy Spirit in emanating His presence in acting from heaven. One is Pentecostals do not believe in sequential modalism. The idea that, that God first started as the Father, then He became the Holy Spirit, and then He became the Son. Or we do not believe that God first became the Father, then He became the Son, and then He became the Holy Spirit. No, we believe that God the Father has always been the eternal Holy Spirit. The timeless God is a spirit, and He's holy. Therefore, God is a spirit. He's a Holy Spirit. Usually, the title Holy Spirit in inspired scripture speaks of God's spirit coming down from heaven, descending from heaven to act and speak and work in doing something for mankind. It does not speak of the Holy Spirit as a third co-equal timeless God the Son person because the scriptures state in Luke 135 that the reason why the Son is called the Son is because of his virgin conception and birth. For the angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and for that reason the child shall be called the Son of God. There's no other reason why the Son is called the Son but the New Testament reason given in Luke 135. Therefore the Son is the man and the man is the son who was born in Bethlehem. Therefore the son had a beginning by his virgin conception and birth, but the son could not have always timelessly existed in light of inspired scriptures, such as Hebrews 1.5, which is a quote from 2 Samuel 7.14. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. God the Father could not have said during the Old Testament time period, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son, if the Son has always had a relationship with His Father throughout eternity past. The Father Spirit has always existed without a beginning. But the Son is Emmanuel, God with us, as a true man, because God also became a true man via virgin conception and birth. Now that God has become a man, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit simultaneously exist because the Holy Spirit is the divine spirit of the only true God the Father, who also became a true man as a true son. So, sequential modalism, we do not believe that God started as the Father, then He became the Holy Spirit, and then He became the Son, or we don't believe that the Father started as the Father, became the Son, then became the Holy Spirit. We believe God has always existed as the Father, who is the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is God's Spirit manifesting or acting coming down from heaven, like the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary, Luke 135. But now that the Son was conceived and born, the Son was granted a distinct life by the Father, a distinct human life, which is ontologically distinct 
from the divine life of the Holy Spirit up in heaven. For God became a man by reproducing his essence of being as a true human being, according to Hebrews 1.3 and Hebrews 2.17. The scriptures teach that God the Father is the omnipresent Holy Spirit, who alone has always existed throughout eternity past. But when the fullness of the time had come, God's Holy Spirit descended from heaven upon the Virgin to be manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and becoming a true human son by being made fully human in every way, Hebrews 2, 17. Hence the Son is Emmanuel, God with us as a man who was sent after he was made of a woman. Therefore, oneness believers reject the idea that God is never the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time. Because the omnipresent God can simultaneously act and speak in heaven and earth at the same time. He is not bound like a created angel or a human being who cannot act and speak in more than one place at once. The idea that the early modalistic monarchians taught sequential modalism primarily came from two of their semi-Aryan opponents, namely Hippolytus and Tertullian. Sequential modalism is the idea that God first existed as the Father, then he later became the Son, then he later became the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church. While the scriptures teach that the Father's Holy Spirit has always existed throughout eternity past, the scriptures do not teach that the Son has always existed as a child born and as a son given. It is hard to believe that the early modalists could have taught that the Holy Spirit did not exist before the Incarnation because the scriptures repeatedly state that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father himself throughout the Hebrew Bible. Genesis 1-2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God's Spirit in action. God descended over the dark planet, the water-filled planet, he descended over the waters, and then God spoke, let there be light, and so forth. The Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Job 33, 4. We know our Heavenly Father made us. You are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And we are all the works of your hands. We are all the works of our Father's hands. So who created the heavens and the earth? Who gave mankind life? Our Heavenly Father. It says, you are our Father. We are the clay. We human beings are the clay. You are the potter. We human beings are all the work or works of your hands. But Job 33, 4 says, the Spirit of God made me. So how did the Spirit of God made us, make us? As our Heavenly Father. Since our Father created mankind by the works of His hands, the Holy Spirit of God, who Job said has made me, has to be the Spirit of our Heavenly Father as our sole creator. Psalm 51, 11 says, do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. John 4, 23, 24 says that God the Father is a spirit, and he is holy. Therefore, God the Father is the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says that there's only one Lord, one faith, one spirit. Since God is a spirit as one spirit, and the scripture says in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 that God is the spirit, the Lord is the spirit, one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God and Father above all, through us all, and in us all. Our Father is the Spirit of God, who also is the Holy Spirit in action, and who is also the Holy Spirit who descended upon the Hebrew Virgin to supernaturally conceive and incarnate His substance of being as a true human being through virgin conception and birth. Psalm 139.7 says, Where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Only one God has one spirit and one presence. Isaiah 31 through 2 says, Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, Yahweh, to those who carry out plans that are not from me, forming an alliance but not by my spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Father's spirit, heaping sin upon sin to go down to Egypt. For lack of time, next verse. Isaiah 63, 10 through 14. Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Whose spirit? God the Father's spirit. So he turned and became their enemy. For lack of time, I'm going to go down. Where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of the flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? Going down like cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. 
One Lord, one faith, one spirit, one Holy Spirit, one God and Father above all, through all, and in us all. Ephesians chapter 4. Luke 1 through 5 and Matthew 1 20 prove that the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin to supernaturally conceive the Christ child. Hence the idea that the modalists believe that the Holy Spirit did not exist until after the New Testament church was established is completely absurd. Under monarchianism, the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia admits, it is true that it is easy to suppose that Tertullian and Hippolytus to have misrepresented the opinions of their opponents. The context of the New Advent Encyclopedia shows that it is easy to suppose that Tertullian and Hippolytus, who lived in the early 3rd century, to have misrepresented the opinions of their opponents in falsely accusing them of patripassionism, meaning the Father as the Father suffered and died, and sequential modalism, the Father, Son, and Spirit could only exist sequentially, but not at the same time. This is the opinions of Tertullian and Hippolytus, who were apparently false accusing the modalistic monarchians. Because the New Advent Encyclopedia says that it is very possible that Hippolytus and Tertullian were misrepresenting their opponents. The historical evidence proves that the writings of the 3rd century modalists were burned. Since the historical evidence proves that the writings of the 3rd century modalists were destroyed, neglected, and burned, we cannot know for certain if any of the ancient modalists had ever taught patriot passionism, meaning the father as the father suffered and died, or sequential modalism. Under Sibelius, the New Abbot Encyclopedia admits all of his original works were burned. The context proves all of Sibelius's writings were burned. Author Paul Paval wrote, no writings of Praxis or Sibelius survived today because they were considered heresy by the church. Church historian B.B. Edwards wrote that he, the context proof Sibelius, was a writer, cannot well be questioned. The younger Arnobius says that in the 5th century, some of his writings were still extant. Of what nature these were, he has not told us. End quote. Since most of the writings of the late 2nd and 3rd century modalists were burned, we cannot know with certainty the details of their theological position. However, the earliest 1st century post-apostolic church had taught that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ who became incarnate. Therefore, the first century apostolic church had to have been modalistic monarchian in theology. 2 Clement 14, 3 and 4 says, and I quote, The context says the Holy Spirit. Guard the flesh that she may partake of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, if we say that the flesh is the church as the Spirit is Christ, then verily he who has dishonored the flesh has dishonored the church. Such a one therefore shall not partake of the Spirit. The context proves the Holy Spirit. Shall not partake of the Spirit which is Christ. Trinitarians are supposed to believe that the Holy Spirit is not the Son and the Son is not the Spirit. But the New Testament, first century apostolic church, Clement of Rome, Bishop of Rome, taught that the, the Holy Spirit is Christ. Hermas Parable 5.6 says, again, Hermas was a 1st century prophet in the Roman church. The pre-existent Holy Spirit was created all things, did God make to dwell in a body of flesh chosen by himself. So here we see, the pre-existent Holy Spirit incarnated himself in the body of Jesus Christ as a man. Hermas Similitude 9.1 says, The angel of repentance, he came and said to me, to Hermas, I want to show you what the Holy Spirit which spoke with you in the form of the church showed you. For that spirit... The Holy Spirit is the Son of God. Ignatius of Antioch to Magnesians 15.1 says, Very well in the harmony of God, you who have obtained the inseparable Spirit who is Jesus Christ. The inseparable Spirit, according to Ignatius, who lived in the first century, he was the Bishop of Antioch somewhere around 67 to 69 AD, all the way to his death about 107 AD. He said that the inseparable spirit is Jesus Christ. Since only one this modalistic theology teaches that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Son of God, who became incarnate as Christ, the first century post-apostolic church had to have been modalistic. For even Tertullian had admitted that the one this modalists were among those who always make up the majority of believers as far back as he knew, from 160 to 225. 
Thus, it is hard to believe that the 3rd century Molas could have taught that the Holy Spirit did not exist as the Father Spirit throughout eternity past, while the Molas of the 1st and early 2nd century had believed that the Holy Spirit has always existed to become Jesus Christ in the Incarnation through the Virgin. Let us play the video clip from 57 through 106. A little bit of trouble with that at the baptism of Jesus, <laughs> right? I mean, he's changing hats really fast. John MacArthur said, a little bit of trouble at the baptism of Jesus. He is changing hats really fast. And the whole congregation laughed. Oneness theology does not teach that God had to change hats or masks really fast, because our Heavenly Father's omnipresent Holy Spirit can simultaneously exist, act, and speak in heaven and on earth at the selfsame time. Oneness believers do not teach that the Holy Spirit suddenly became the Holy Spirit, as if He didn't exist throughout eternity past. That's nonsense. We don't believe that. We don't believe that God had to change hats or masks and quickly become the Holy Spirit, speak of the Spirit, jump into another mask and be the Father, and jump into another mask and be the Son, and never be able to speak or do anything all at the same time. That's ridiculous. That's totally absurd. The omnipresent God doesn't have to be in one place at one time like finite, failed human understanding. And I am about 99% certain that no one this model has ever taught that God sometimes spoke as the Father, had to change Mass and then speak as the Son, and change Mass again and speak as the Holy Spirit. There is no historical evidence whatsoever to prove that any ancient modalists believed in sequential modalism. Matthew 3, 16-17 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now Trinitarians falsely alleged in their imagination that God is like finite man. And so God the Father was speaking from heaven while a third divine person with spirit was descending upon Jesus and the Son was there perhaps praying in the Jordan River. We got three persons here acting here. At least two of the persons were speaking at the same time. Well, the Holy Spirit didn't speak as a third person. The Father spoke while his own Holy Spirit descended upon the Virgin because God could do two things at once. He's the omnipresent God. He can do many things at once. He can do a hundred or a thousand or a million things all at one time. And then we go to Isaiah 42.1 and we find out a little bit more about the baptism of Christ. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delight. I have put my spirit upon him. Now the scripture says, my chosen one in whom my soul, Hebrew word nephesh is the same thing as person, in whom my person delights. The Spirit of God descended like, descended like a dove upon Jesus, resting on him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, this is my son in whom I am well pleased is the same thing as saying, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I'm happy with him. I'm pleased with him. I'm delighted with him. Delighted means the same thing as pleased at the baptism of Christ. So let me read the text in context. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul or my person delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. End quote. Obviously talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in a very similar way that the Spirit of God descend like a dove on Jesus, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I am well delighted. According to Isaiah, God the Father put His own Spirit upon the Messiah. I have put my Spirit upon Him. Here we see that our only true God, the Father, spoke from heaven, while His own omnipresent Spirit descend like a dove, not as a dove literally, but like a dove descends from heaven, upon the man Christ Jesus. Thus we only see one divine person, who is our Heavenly Father, speaking and descending from heaven upon one human person, the man Christ Jesus. For God's divine spirit also became one human person via incarnation through the Virgin. Hebrews 1.3 states that Jesus is the brightness, as a son, is the brightness of His, the Father's glory, and He's the express image of His, the Father's divine person, 
who became a human person. Nothing in the text shows three co-equal God persons at Christ's baptism. As we see only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For the one divine omnipresent spirit called the Father is a spirit. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks. Whose spirit? It's the Father's spirit seeking true worshippers to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jeremiah 23, 24 says that the omnipresent spirit fills the heavens and the earth, and John 4, 23, 24 says that God is a spirit, and that spirit is the Father who seeks two worshipers to worship him in spirit and truth, not them in spirit and truth. So there's only one divine omnipresent spirit called the Father, who remained unchangeable in the heavens. I am Yahweh, I change not. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. While he also descended upon the man Christ Jesus at his baptism. This was that Holy Spirit of the Father who led Jesus into the wilderness. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And did the mighty works through Jesus. Jesus said, the Father abiding in me, he does the works. John 14, 10. For when God became a man in the incarnation, through the virgin conception and birth, that man was granted a distinct human life, just as the Father has life in himself as the divine spirit. Because God the Father also became a true man person as the Son within the virgin. Therefore, the oneness interpretation has to be the only correct exegesis, because God as God cannot be tempted of evil, as a son, as a God the Son, neither can God as God pray to God with a distinct human nature, because God is not ontologically a man. Numbers 23, 19 says God is not a man, nor a son of man. So Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, only because God became a true man, which enabled Jesus to have the capacity to pray, the capacity to be led up by the Spirit of God, and the capacity to be tempted of evil. Book of James 1.13 says God cannot be tempted of evil. So Jesus is not Emmanuel God with us as God. He's Emmanuel God with us as a true man. Everything Jesus said and did, he spoke as a true man with divine revelation of his true divine identity. When he said before Abraham was I am, and he that has seen me has seen the Father. Let us play the video clip from 225 to 233. Councils of Nicaea, 325, Constantinople, 381, modalism was universally condemned as heresy. John MacArthur said at the closing of his video, the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, 325, Nicaea and Constantinople, 381, modalism was universally condemned as heresy. Now, the second part of John MacArthur's statement is correct. In 381, at the Council of Constantinople, Sibelianism or modalism was condemned as heresy. But at 325, the Council of Nicaea, modalism was not condemned as heresy. I challenge anyone to cite historical evidence to show that the AD 325 Council of Nicaea universally condemned modalism as heresy. These are the exact words of John MacArthur. That modalism or Sibelianism was universally condemned as heresy in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. The 381 Council of Constantinople condemned modalism, but not the 325 A.D. Council of Nicaea. Therefore, we can see that Mr. John MacArthur does not know much about church history, nor does he know what he's talking about when speaking against oneness theology with his false accusations of what he thinks that we believe. So I challenge everyone who watched this video to do further research, further studies. I have, if you would like to hear more about church history, or should I say what really happened in church history, I have produced many articles and videos and books on this subject at apostolicchristianfaith.com. In our website, we have everything cataloged for you in order, scriptural order, uh, cataloged according to the alphabet of the names of people in church history, the theology of Ignatius, the theology of Hermas, the theology of Clement of Rome, and so forth. 
what the earliest Christians believed was monolithic monarchian in theology. They did not believe in a trinity. And I challenge any Trinitarian to cite proof that there were any true Trinitarians living within the first 250 years of Christian history. They were evolving into Trinitarianism from semi-Arianism, but and also with some modalistic influence. So even the Nicene Creed has modalistic influence, so much so that there were many modalists who signed the Nicene Creed, such as Marcellus Van Kyra, who was their principal speaker. Marcellus Van Kyra unified with Athanasius to form the Nicene Creed. So the Nicene Creed was not against modalism, or the modalists would never have signed the creed. So if you enjoyed any of this information, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel right here, Global Impact Ministries, or visit our website at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless you all.